born in Excel on the 6th of November 1956, Mark de True was the oldest of five children. His parents were teachers and at one point emigrated to the Belgian Congo where they taught. But when the crisis erupted in that country, they brought Dutroux back to Belgium in 1960. His parents eventually separated in 1971 and 15-year-old Dutroux stayed with his mother. We know that his mother was incredibly dominant, his father was very aggressive. So I think it was quite a hostile environment to, to grow up in. And I think those attachments or lack of attachments with his parents in those early years did play quite a, a role in, in the person he became. Trained as an electrician but often unemployed, Dutroux soon began a long criminal history, including convictions for car theft, mugging and drug dealing. Dutroux had a lot of contact with the police. He stepped up from car theft into a rather grand form of car theft, which involved shipping quite expensive luxury cars, which he'd stolen in Belgium, out of the country into Czechoslovakia and Hungary. The profit from his crimes led to Dutroux owning seven properties in and around the city of Charlois, 45 miles south of Brussels. By 1983, 26-year-old Dutroux was married with two children, but he'd begun an affair with a schoolteacher called Michel Martin. The 23-year-old would eventually become Dutroux's partner in life and crime, with whom he also had three more children. The severity of Dutroux's crimes escalated from theft to sexual assault, and in 1989, he was found guilty of the abduction and rape of five young girls, one of whom was just 11 years old. Mark Dutroux was a predator who selected his prey very carefully. He wanted to choose people who were easy to, to target in the first place, easy to abduct, but also easy to manipulate once he had them under his control. So he would go for the most vulnerable victims that, that he could find that fulfilled his desires. Dutroux's now wife, Michelle, was found to be complicit in the abductions and served two years of a five-year sentence. The psychiatrists suggest that Martine and Dutroux, husband and wife, are a classic example of folie à deux, that one egged the other on, and that therefore the sum of the two of them was even more dangerous than one alone. I think when we look at the relationship between Dutroux and his wife, who was implicated in, in many of his crimes, it is quite interesting. Um, it, it's quite possible that, that, that some people see her as, as just another one of his victims, somebody else who was manipulated and, and coerced by him. Um, and when we look at Mark Dutroux and his behaviour, he is incredibly charming at times and he can be very persuasive. Um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if he'd set out with the intention of recruiting somebody to, to help him in his crimes. And this is somebody who, who fell for his charms and, and went along with it. In December 1995, Dutroux was arrested in relation to a car theft. He was convicted and served almost four months in prison. During this time, the police searched his Marcinelle home. They were agonizingly close to finding out Dutroux's darkest secret. Twice in December 1995, on the 13th and the 19th, police searched the house in Charlois. One of the most poignant and tragic parts of that search, which included a search of the basement, was that the police failed to identify the dungeon. Even more horrifying, the two policemen who searched the house were accompanied by a locksmith who would help them. The locksmith told the policeman that he heard screams. The policeman said, oh, it must be from outside, and disregarded him. The terrible truth is that it was from the two eight-year-olds hidden in this cell, this dungeon. 
At De True's house, officers had also found several VHS cassette tapes, but investigators didn't watch them until much later. There was a video, a home video made by Mark De True, um, where he was filming the developments in the works in his, his child cage. This was, was essential proof that they were on, 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 the, on the right track. But for some, some strange reason, they did this house search and they didn't exploit the, the information they got from it. The police mistakes came at a fatal cost. By the time De True arrived back home after his release from prison in March 1996, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo were dead. De True, his wife Michelle Martin, and an accomplice, Michelle Lalievre, were taken in for questioning. Over several hours of interrogations, all three maintained their innocence. He was consistent in his lies, following each lie by telling another lie. It was a manipulative behavior. But otherwise, he stayed very, very calm. Belgian authorities had no choice but to eventually release Lalievre, who denied being with De True on the day Letitia was kidnapped. But moments after he left the police station in Charlois, a startling witness account came through. Les voisins de la maison de the neighbours of his property in Marcenay saw Marc de True and Lilève return on Friday evening carrying a child covered by a blanket as they returned to his house, to de True's house. Lelièvre was immediately re-arrested and taken back into custody. As his accomplice's alibi began to crumble, de True's interrogation took a drastic turn. De True knows that we had proof that Letitia was in the car, so he says, yes, I was in Batrice, which he denied at the start. I met a young girl, I talked with her, and then she told me she was tired of her parents. Stories, because there are parts against him and he changes the stories to suit his narrative on the spot. Then, at the same time, Lilev said she was with the True, and finally on Thursday, he ends up telling us, now that all of these parts of the story contradict each other, I will give you the two girls. De True pointed to a poster inside the interrogation room of another missing girl, Sabine Dardenne. Twelve-year-old Sabine had been kidnapped by him in May. Two days after his arrest, De True confessed and took the police to the basement where Sabine and Letitia were found alive. On the 15th of August, 1996, De True led the investigators to his property in Marcinelle, where hidden behind a false wall in the basement was the dungeon where he'd been keeping Sabine Dardenne and Letitia Del Hay locked up. He pulled down the wardrobe and inside the cage behind was Sabine and Letitia. And then we got this, yeah, at that, that moment incredible news that two kidnapped girls had been found alive in the cage of a, a person who had been convicted before for this kind of crimes. It was such a huge thing. All the journalists were on the scene at the time. The news, magazines were there. It is as if there had been a terrorist attack. No one could believe that such a person could exist in Belgium. It was unthinkable. Douglas de Conning was one of the few journalists who was allowed to enter de True's basement. We had seen pictures, we had been seen images, but being there is, is uh, difficult to describe because it's 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 like constructed to to you wouldn't even put a dock in uh, such a small place. This was really the, the the kind of cage they made to 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 hide guns from the police. As Belgium awoke in shock to the news that a man from Marcinelle had abducted, raped and tortured two girls over several months, the families of Sabine Dardenne and Letitia Del Hay rejoiced that their daughters had been found alive. 
There are rare occasions when we find the relatives and a policeman or a magistrate has the opportunity to return a child who have been kidnapped in such circumstances alive. It's fantastic, obviously. It is a joy that can be shared with the parents. Over the next 48 hours, investigators continued to relentlessly question De True. They were desperate to find the two eight-year-old girls, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo, who'd been missing for more than a year. Well, De True was playing a game with his investigators. He knew that uh, he, he never would get out of prison anymore. He knew that he would be presented as uh, the most famous criminal we've ever had in Belgium and he wanted to exploit that situation. He had to be flattered. They had to make him believe that they believed his pitiful story, make him believe that things were not that bad for him. It's true that you were ingenious on this one. You were not caught and you fooled the police and here and there. At that point, his ego, his ego had been flattered and little by little he let information slip. That's his attitude. After 48 hours of this cat and mouse game, Mark Dutroux finally revealed to investigators that he had abducted the two eight-year-old girls. It was a crime that shocked the nation and left a family heartbroken. In October 2012, five-year-old April Jones was abducted whilst playing outside her home on the Brinigog estate in the small town of Mahankleth in Mid Wales. As news of April's disappearance spread through the media, police and volunteers scoured the town and countryside, kick-starting what was to become the biggest search for a missing person in the history of British policing. She's got to be around here somewhere. She's got to be. We will search and we'll go miles. We will travel miles to find her. But April's body would never be found. She'd been abducted and murdered by 46-year-old Mark Bridger, a local man and well-known member of the community. April's sister, Jasmine, was just 16 years old at the time. I kind of just knew him. Mum and Dad knew him and said, hi, you're right. Um, quick sort of chat in the street about cars and bikes and that. When I was walking past, just kind of quick hello and off he went. After Bridger's arrest, police searched his laptop and found indecent pictures of children and screenshots of young girls from the area taken from their social media accounts. Local reporter Kieran Jones reported on the case. When you look at what was found on Bridger's laptop, there are a few ways that this case could have been more troubling. When you see images of April Jones, it's clear that Bridger had this grotesque fascination with young girls, with those type of scenarios where young girls were abducted and killed. And that absolutely is something that is condemning, condemning evidence. This killer's story begins over 50 years ago. Mark Bridger was born in Carsholton, Surrey, on the 6th of November, 1965. He grew up in a happy family environment with his parents and two siblings. There weren't any indications for me in terms of Mark Bridges' childhood or his adolescence that would indicate that he'd go on to, to do something horrendous. He did seem to be an altogether very average young lad and there were no red flags. His childhood was normal compared to most people. He came from a, a middle-class um, family. His father was a police officer, which he actually looked up to. But by 1984, 18-year-old Bridger had gone off the rails. He dropped out of college and struggled to hold a job down. All the jobs he got, he was a bit of a failure. So by the age of 20, this guy is like, he failed in school, he failed in college, he failed on, on whatever he wanted to do. In 1984, Bridger had his first brush with the law. He was convicted of theft and a firearms offence. And basically, the, the story that, that he concocted around this was that he'd planned to go and fire an old pistol at a friend's farm, and he'd stolen a car because it was too far for him to walk, which does seem to be rather ludicrous. And the prosecution thought that actually something altogether different had gone on. He was planning to actually carry out an armed robbery with this weapon and this stolen car. So what Mark Bridger is doing from this point is He's getting used to lying, to being comfortable in a lie, to maintaining a lie, and this is something he'll do throughout his life. 
Bridger was placed on probation for two years and he struggled to find work. He lived in a fantasy world, often telling people he had a military background. On the evening of October the 1st, 2012, five-year-old April Jones was playing outside the front of her family home on the Brinigog estate in Marhankleth, Mid Wales. April's mum and dad, Coral and Paul, had just returned from a parents' evening at the local school. It was still light that day, so I remember to let April out a little bit longer um, because of the good school report. And there was three of their friends, and her and her other friend cycled their other friend back home, and then it was just her and her friend they were coming back. At around 7.20 p.m., Coral grew concerned that her daughter had been out a little too long. She sent April's brother out to look for her. And then Harley came running back with the bike, saying she's gone, she's not there, um, she's been taken. And then that's when it kind of all escalated. Pack, pick emergency. I've been kidnapped. I've been kidnapped with a dog. Hang on, Val, can you speak to them for me? Hello. And what makes you think um, the dog well, has been kidnapped? Well, apparently, um, she's gone off in a car with somebody. Somebody picked her up in a car or something. Okay, what's the name of the child that's gone missing? April Jones. April, how old is she? Five. Detective Superintendent Reg Bevan was part of the investigation team. When a call first comes in, it's a crime in action, in effect. So April's mum makes the initial call to say that her daughter's gone off in a vehicle. That is treated as a abduction, kidnap, and the initial response is very much to secure the area, try to identify the last person to see her and identifying people who were in the area at the time. Detectives immediately questioned April's young friends who'd seen her get into a car with a stranger. They gave this basic description of a small front and a large rear to a vehicle and we, they couldn't be more specific, but these are children, young children. And it, but it was a key piece of evidence, particularly when they talk about how she got into the right-hand side and they were quite um, sure of that. I think the real crucial detail that they were able to drill down very, very quickly was that April may have got into what would ordinarily appear to be the driver's side, which indicated perhaps that it was a, a left-hand drive vehicle. I think that was very, very quickly seized upon as something that was unusual, something that could perhaps be decisive in the investigation. Because other than that, initially, there didn't seem to be a great deal for the police to go on, because she'd been seized very, very quickly, very, very discreetly, with only children as witnesses. Meanwhile, the local community in Mahankleth rallied round the Jones family and assisted the police in their search for April. News of her disappearance quickly spread on social media. Mahankleth is such a small town, you just wouldn't think of it. I think we have a population of about two and a half thousand, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. Five, six, seven. The amount of people that came out of the houses and just started searching of all sorts of ages, all sorts of ages, it was just incredible to even see, like, they've all kind of come out just to look for my little sister. And it's kind of breathtaking in a way to see the amount of people and how close Mac is, how close the community is. From the very first day, I think the police were using the word unprecedented in terms of the scale of the search. And that was certainly true. I remember arriving in McCunthleth and immediately hearing the constant swashing of rotor blades, seeing boat teams coming in from mountain rescue scene, cavers, every conceivable emergency service, every conceivable specialism was there very, very quickly. And then you had the public element of the search where people were splitting into small teams, dividing up an area on a map and going out and fanning out and covering what area they could. People at the most rudimentary level going out with torches and calling April's name. So you had an unprecedented police search involving, I think, in the end, dozens and dozens of forces covering dozens and dozens of square kilometres. Despite an exhaustive search by police and volunteers stretching into the early hours, April could not be found. The small town was in shock. The disturbing discovery at Mount Pleasant Cottage shocked the entire community. There almost certainly was no longer any chance of a happy ending to this story, a positive outcome of April coming home to her family. And that was very, very powerful 
and when you saw the tiredness that people understandably felt, two, three days of hard working, searching, not going to sleep, to have everything that they'd worked for crushed in that way was deeply, deeply dispiriting for everybody. And it was clear quite quickly that there needed to be then that further little bit of perspective and of rowing back a little bit from the media and from everybody that was there just to give people, not just the family, but the people in the town that had been so affected, that little bit of space and that little bit of freedom to, to grieve and to process everything that had happened. For a while they were searching for April and they were hoping she'd come back alive. And I think it was a couple of days later or something or other that it turned into a search for the body. And I kind of knew then it must have been some horrific crime for them to search into a body. And then in the sort of town we live in where there's rivers flowing through, there's forestry everywhere, I kind of knew it must have been something quite bad. Otherwise you kind of would have found a child's body around the sort of area straight away. After three days of questioning, on October the 5th, 2012, Mark Bridger was arrested on suspicion of murder. But the 46-year-old continued to protest his innocence. In interview, he's very matter-of-fact in his answers, and he says that he's run over her accidentally, and that he gets out of his vehicle and sees that he's run over her, on, and he picks her up, and he thinks, believes she's dead. He does try resuscitating her. But at each stage, when you're then able to rebut some of his story by saying, well, there's no forensic evidence to show that she's come to any harm in your vehicle, albeit we could put uh, her inside the vehicle with fingerprints, he would always suggest, well, she wasn't bleeding. So when you'd ask him, well, how do you know that she's dead then? You know, he was saying, well, I knew she was dead. His story didn't make sense. The reason why people hold back information about murder can vary from one case to the next, but for, for me, the, the central element is often control. When somebody has been convicted of murder, when somebody has been sentenced to a very lengthy term in prison, they don't have control over many things at all. The one thing that they do have control over is the knowledge of, of what happened, or of what they did to their victim, of where their victim is, and often that's something that people won't want to part with very easily. Nothing that he said we could back up with any evidence or forensic recoveries. In fact, everything led quite the contrary. He had abducted April from outside near to her home and had driven her back to his house immediately and she probably met her in very soon after that. He could have been curbing it for a long time, but on that day, he overpowered him. And once she was in the car, then that was it. Then he goes into a different state of mind that then he can't stop it anymore. It will be very hard for him to stop. The following day, October the 6th, Mark Bridger was charged with the abduction and murder of five-year-old April Jones. The story of the serial killing duo began just over 70 years ago in 1945. The elder of the pair, Leonard Lake, was born in the wake of World War II. Lake had a troubled childhood. His family um, have got a, a history of, of working in the US Navy. They, they move around a lot. There's quite a lot of volatility in the family unit, quite a lot of drinking. Age six, Lake's parents separated, and he and his siblings were sent to live with their grandparents. There, his grandmother allegedly encouraged some lewd behavior. He, as a boy, had been encouraged by his grandmother to take naked pictures of his sisters. And I think that this gave him this fixation that meant that he was always, to some extent, wanted to manipulate women. As a young man, Lake developed his own unhealthy urges. Leonard Lake identified with a book by John Fowles uh, called The Collector which was written in 1963, and basically the story of the collector was a, a clerk called Frederick Clegg. He collected butterflies. And for some reason, suddenly developed a fixation on a girl called Miranda, and decides to abduct Miranda so that she becomes part of his butterfly collection. Lake becomes obsessed. 
with having women as his sex slaves, uh, keeping women in an enclave that he's going to develop because he's going to survive a nuclear Armageddon. In 1965, age 19, Lake joined the US Marine Corps and served two tours in the Vietnam War as a radar operator. I think it tipped him over the edge, the possibility that he would find himself in close combat fighting, and essentially snapped. And that was the genesis of the man that became really a ferocious killer. In 1971, Lake was diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder and was given a medical discharge. He re-emerged in San Francisco, where he began to explore his dark fantasies. He married in San Francisco in 1975. His wife finally couldn't stand him because he made amateur porn films. A lot of sadomasochism, a lot of bondage. His wife was very upset by that and effectively threw him out. In 1977, still in the San Francisco Bay Area, Lake met his second wife. Nicknamed Cricket, she indulged his peculiar habits. Cricket was an active participant in his, again, amateur uh, porn films and appeared in many of them. This is the thing about abusive men like Leonard Lake. They're not abusive all of the time. They're able to charm, they're able to manipulate, they're able to, to spin a good story to people who they want to support them. 15 years younger, Charles Ng seemed an unlikely choice for a friend. Charles Ng was born in Hong Kong in 1960, the son of a wealthy Chinese businessman, a harsh disciplinarian. One of Ng's releases was to be a kleptomaniac. He stole things. He stole things because it made him feel better about himself. And he did it repeatedly. Aged 15, Ng was sent to a boarding school in England, but it did not go well. Charles Ng's family were, were consistently embarrassed by him. So he was moved around from, from school to school. He ended up at boarding school in Yorkshire, where he, he carried on with this behavior. He did academically well for a while, so he was a child who was quite bright. But he, he just couldn't help himself in terms of stealing and create all of this chaos. And I think he was quite enjoying that. In 1978, aged 18, Ng moved to the US on a student visa. He moved to California to study, but he soon got into trouble again. He was involved in a hit and run. In October 1979, aged 18, Charles Ng was arrested and forced to pay for the damages. Then, in a strange twist, a year later, the Hong Kong resident and British citizen lied about his nationality and joined the US Marine Corps. But less than a year after he joined, old habits resurfaced. In 1982, when by this time Ng was 22, he was arrested for stealing explosives and weaponry. Ng was sentenced to 14 years in military detention in Hawaii. It was while he was in jail that Ng formed an uncommon friendship with Leonard Lake. Charles Ng moved into Lake's new remote ranch in the Northern Californian wilderness. It was the combination of the two individuals that made them into the terrible killing machine that they became. Here, Lake and Ng shared their depraved fantasies and together they devised a fearsome plan to murder men, women and even infants on an industrial scale. On the grounds of the two-acre property, Lake had built a subterranean bunker for his and his partner Ng's murderous purpose. In Calaveras County, east of San Francisco, where, effectively, Lake set up the dungeon that he'd always wanted for his Operation Miranda, where Ng came to join him. Based on Lake's obsession with the book, The Collector, the pair teamed up to put Leonard Lake's fearsome fantasy, his so-called Miranda plan, into motion. 
the Miranda plan was the means by which he was going to be the one who fathered all the new children in the world after the, the nuclear Armageddon had happened and he was in his enclave with all of his sex slaves. That's what he was creating with Ng, and that's what he had been fantasizing for 20 years before he met Ng. The project's aim is to capture your ideal woman, enslave her, and have her be your sexual slave until you're done with her, at which time you kill her. In the case of Ng and Lake, the killings involve much more than killings, much more than just sex. They involve torture, they involve the photographing of victims, it was a nightmare that somebody from Hollywood could not dream up for a horror movie. Ing arrives, and in a sense, they combust the fantasy because they start saying to each other, what we need is to have lots of children to repopulate the world and make better citizens, a kind of a social engineering project through a very odd prism. Ing was a very shy person who himself could not have done this but happily joined the venture so that he would have a chance of, of the kind of sexuality his shyness made impossible. On July the 25th, 1984, Lake and Ng's perverse Miranda plan was begun. The first woman they were thought to have abducted and enslaved was Deborah Dubbs. The duo would in fact murder her, her husband Harvey, and their 16-month-old son, Sean. Answering an ad for video equipment, Lake and Ng showed up at their apartment in San Francisco. The pair likely killed Harvey and the baby soon after. Lake and Ng then kidnapped 33-year-old Deborah and took her back to their underground bunker. In the case of the Dubs family, they, they took all of their photographic equipment. Mr. Dubbs used to do f photography work on the side. They abducted his wife and raped her. In Wilseyville, in Calaveras County, Lake and Ng kept Deborah prisoner. In what would become their modus operandi, the callous killing team would torture, defile, and humiliate Deborah. In all, the team gathered 45 pounds of charred remains. They belonged to at least 11 victims killed in the 11-month spree, including six men, three women, and two babies. All had been identified. Ingham Lake, one of the most unusual things is that they were said to have fed some of the remains of their victims to chickens, of all things. It actually makes a kind of perverse sense. If you've burnt a body, you're left mainly with bone, it can be ground up, and that's the sort of thing a chicken could eat. Now that investigators knew about the terrible crimes that Lake and Ing had callously committed, they had to catch the fugitive serial killer, Charles Ing. Ing leaves and runs, and crosses the border into Canada, Calgary, and to where his sister lives. Leonard Lake had committed suicide, but his serial killing partner, Charles Ing, was still alive, and detectives were now determined to catch him. It would not take long. Over 1,200 miles away, and less than a month after he fled San Francisco, Ing would succumb to his shoplifting urges once again. This time, it would lead to the serial killer's demise. July the 6th, 1985, Calgary, Canada. The net was closing in on Charles Ing. Based upon information, one of his uh, associates had given to the FBI, we felt he probably had gone across the border up into Canada. So his picture was being distributed up there. Now, Canada, the FBI has international offices in Canada. So when somebody like Ng flees there, the FBI can be on it fairly quickly. Less than a month after he fled the San Francisco Bay Area, Charles Ng fatefully succumbed to one of his urges. That strain of kleptomania, that had uh, run through his childhood, didn't disappear in adulthood. And indeed, it was Ing's kleptomania that in the end saw him caught and brought to justice. And it's almost pathetic. He goes and he steals a can of salmon 
in a supermarket. And a couple of store detectors approach him and he was armed and he pulled out his gun and shot one of the store clerks. The security guard manages to hang on to him despite having been shot in the hand and the police are called. Ing is taken and then almost immediately they realize that they have the man that the American authorities want. <laughs> 